Kelly, thank you very much and welcome to all of you for joining us today. Um, thank you. Uh, we appreciate your interest uh, on this uh, topic of HVAC and the fundamentals of HVAC. The first webinar Wednesday session we held in 2023 was on health and well being, one breath at a time. And we proposed during that presentation that good indoor air quality can be achieved at <clears throat> without paying an energy penalty as otherwise prescribed by uh, other solutions prescribed by ASHRAE's epidemic task force. Uh, in order to reduce the risk of infection, the task force appropriately came forward with suggestions and recommendations for creating a more risk free environment for infection. However, there often was associated an energy penalty uh, to adopt those practices, such as uh, better filtration for air handlers, uh, more outside air uh, to flush the building with outside air, etc. And many of these recommendations have a cost. However, the purpose of this webinar Wednesday series is to educate our community or make them more aware that to have better IAQ does not necessarily mean to compromise energy performance. And that was the original goal and objective. Throughout my years uh, within the industry and being an educator, however, uh, it has come to my understanding that there's a, a hesitance to adopt innovative technologies to provide more energy efficient HVAC solutions, and, and, and understandably so. And I think one of the reasons contributing to that is a lack of understanding of how HVAC systems work and what they're trying to achieve. So I built this program on the fundamentals of HVAC to demonstrate that innovative applications of uh, uh, heating and ventilating systems uh, really are perfectly doable, and we can secure better build environments, healthier build environments, while achieving better system efficiency by applying the various technologies that are available. My name is Dan Hani, and I've been in the industry since 1985. My background is a little unique. I have a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from the University of London and a Master's in Sculpture from Boston University. Started in 1985 working for Norman S. Wright, became an estimator, and uh, in uh, 2000 I joined a new company called Air Specialty Products and uh, serving as an outside salesperson. I moved into engineering sales in 2009, and uh, when I did so, uh, I recognized the need in the industry to begin to introduce uh, energy efficient HVAC solution in into our market. So I, I did so by being a proponent of uh, displacement ventilation systems, underfloor air systems, active and passive chill beam technologies, uh, and uh, passive radiant cooling and heating technologies. I joined Veritech Solutions in 2016 as a sales engineer, and uh, in 2022 was assigned the direct, uh, to being the director of high performance HVAC solutions and company educator. I've had the privilege of participating in a number of articles for the last few years, co-authored with uh, some of our uh, uh, acknowledged leading engineers in our community, and uh, also have a, an article written uh, that I did myself on 100% outside air VAV, VRV systems. Re most recent article was uh, an article in Engineered Systems Magazine, ES Magazine, published in December of 2022 on 100% outside air systems, passive radiant cooling and heating systems. So that was co-authored with Darren Alexander, PE from TWA Panel Systems, and uh, arguing how we can create healthier indoor environments while achieving better system efficiency through HVAC. So who is Veritech? For many of you who are new to these webinar Wednesday sessions, Veritech is an HVAC system solution provider. We have a presence throughout the Southwest from San Diego to Lubbock, Texas, and we can assist with engineering firms on any type of building that is out there and designing and, uh, uh, and laying out equipment for 
any type of uh, building in our market, whether it be education, public works, healthcare, manufacturing, et cetera. And we are an integrated system solution provider. Not only can we do work with engineering teams in designing and laying out mixed air VAV systems, we can assist with variable refrigerant systems, package central plants. We can provide uh, resources for underfloor air systems, 100% outside air systems, et cetera. And with our uh, new control services group, we now have a controls component we can add, which is uh, a very welcome development because it's always good for the controls group to understand what the manufacturer's uh, 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 equipment is designed to do so we can more effectively control it in the field during startup and commissioning. So uh, we're very excited about that. So um, moving from introductions to today's presentation, HVAC fundamentals. Today, we're gonna to look at uh, the purpose and objectives of HVAC systems for comfortable and healthy environments. We're gonna look at thermal comfort. We're gonna look at principles of thermal comfort. We're gonna look at criteria for thermal comfort, modes of heat transfer and heat transfer mediums. And then we're gonna quickly review the ASHRAE standards that apply uh, specifically to thermal comfort. So HVAC, purpose and objectives. Well, it's very, very simple. The purpose of a heating and ventilating and air conditioning system is to provide environments conducive to well-being by maintaining thermal comfort and good IAQ while reducing the risk of germicidal infection for occupants. Thermal comfort is basically maintaining a building occupant's sense of comfort their sense of well-being, their sense of not being uncomfortable. Uh, indoor air quality, of course, is maintaining a quality of air sample in the built environment that does not pose a risk to the health of human occupants. So who defines the criteria for thermal comfort and IAQ for that matter? It's ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration and Air Conditioning Engineers. ASHRAE is an American professional association seeking to advance heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and refrigeration systems through design and construction. And their mission statement is to serve humanity by advancing the arts and sciences of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning, refrigeration, and their allied fields. This is very important because the average person spends 90% of their lives indoors whether at work or in their homes or at school, et cetera. So the indoor, can, indoor air condition is very important so that people can be, remain healthy and be productive without having this sense of discomfort. ASHRAE also writes the HVAC standards adopted by many state and municipal authorities. They provide the minimum requirements for these standards. And they also provide the recommendations and research information. Recently, ASHRAE started its task force for decarbonization. It has actually been working with the federal government for advancing not only more efficient systems that we reduce the amount of carbon emitted through HVAC systems, which, by the way, contribute 40% of a building's carbon generation, either through operational carbon or embodied carbon. And ASHRAE is working to come up with standards to reduce the carbon emissions of HVAC systems. And they're doing that conjointly with the federal government. And they're also doing that with indoor air quality. So be aware of that as uh, the White House issued its first uh, indoor air quality symposium in October. I think we could be seeing some influence of the federal government on how buildings might be designed as a result. But let's move on to today's discussion, thermal comfort. What is thermal comfort? Well, the Green Educational Foundation defines thermal comfort to mean that a person feels neither too cold nor too warm. Oh, that's pretty interesting, pretty vague statements. It goes on to say that thermal comfort is important for health and well-being as well as productivity. ASHRAE Standard 55, 2010, 
defines thermal comfort as the condition of mind that expresses satisfaction with the thermal environment and is assessed by subjective evaluation. Well, who defines the building set points to maintain thermal comfort? It's ASHRAE standard 55, and they do so by taking various thermal comfort factors into mind. And we'll cover those shortly. So occupant comfort, <clears throat> how do we maintain uh, a, a thermal comfort in a space when you consider that there's, everybody has a different body temperature. No two people are the same. We each have a different sense of what it is to be comfortable. Well, the reason for that is because a person's gender, male or female, their age, their size, weight, activity, are they healthy or are they sick? All of these individuals will have different senses of what it is or what conditions contribute to their thermal comfort. Consequently, because of the subjective nature of thermal comfort, ASHRAE standard 55 states that a HVAC system is doing its job if a building can maintain 80% of occupant satisfaction. So, that being stated, what are these principles of thermal comfort that ASHRAE Standard 55 promotes? Well, Standard 55's purpose in the opening documents of the standard states that <clears throat> its purpose is to specify the combinations of indoor thermal environmental factors and personal factors that will produce thermal environmental conditions acceptable to a majority of occupants within a space. Standard 55 assigns space set point conditions that are adopted by various standards. And standard 55 scope is intended that all the criteria in this standard be applied together as comfort in the indoor environment is complex and responds to the interaction of all of the factors. So what are the factors that impact thermal comfort? There's temperature, humidity, radiant heat, airspeed, occupant metabolic rate, and clothing insulation. All of these factors need to be incorporated into a design concept so that they are met and addressed uh, uh, per ASHRAE standard 55. So let's look at each of these individual factors and look at them very closely because we have to have a common understanding of what they mean to begin to know how to apply high performance HVAC designs and what we're trying to achieve with those de designs. So factor number one is temperature. What is temperature? The Oxford Dictionary defines temperature as the degree of intensity of heat present in a substance or object. Intensity of heat. The air temperature is the measure of the rate of molecular movement. And this is one thing that I struggled with for years. What is heat energy? What actually is it? Well, it's a measure of the rate of molecule, molecular motion in the air. The faster the molecules are moving, the more you'll feel a sense of thermal energy and heat in that space. The slower the molecules are moving, the cooler the environment will feel. So the higher the molecular energy or kinetical energy of particles in the air, the higher the temperature you feel in the air. This energy that you feel is measured in the thermostat is referenced as sensible heat energy. Sensible heat energy is the heat that you feel. It's the energy that you feel. I'm hot or I'm, there's an absence of energy, I'm feeling cold. So temperature is a measure of the amount of thermal energy in the air. Thermal energy is also measured in units. <clears throat> the standard for units of measurement are British thermal units, otherwise known as BTUs. One BTU equals the amount of energy to raise one pound of water one degree Fahrenheit. That's simple. One ton of energy, because we often hear HVAC loads in the form of tonnage, one ton of energy is equal to 12,000 BTUs of energy. And this is really in relation to standard conditions. In other words, 95 degrees at sea level 
on your ambient conditions. So 12,000 BTUs of energy. The average adult male produces 400 BTUs of sensible energy per hour, somewhat equivalent to a 75 degree wet bulb. In fact, test labs for HVAC systems often simulate occupants by using towers with 75 degree or 75 watt bulbs mounted in them to generate that sensible heat energy. Another factor that impacts thermal comfort, according to ASHRAE standard 55, is humidity. Standard 55 defines humidity as the moisture content of the air. The common measure of humidity is relative humidity. Uh, standard 55 and standard 62.1 have used historically relative humidity as the reference value for moisture content in the air. However, standard 62.1 is moving away from relative humidity per the 2019 standard and is moving to dew point. And the reason why it's moving to dew point is that unlike relative humidity that is relative to the temperature of the air in which the moisture is contained, dew point and specific humidity are independent of temperature. So they're referenced as absolute measures of moisture content in the sample of air. Well, why do we need to control humidity in an environment? Well, it's to improve thermal comfort for reasons we'll express shortly. It's to prevent water vapor from condensing in a building at diffusers or in windows. Prevents building mold, fungus, and biogrowth. Not a good thing to have. Reduces the risk of spreading infectious germicides. <laughs> Studies came through in the pandemic that a properly humidified building at between 40 to 60% RH is better conducive to human health and the efficiency of operation of our immune systems, as well as reduces the risk of infection because dry environments result in aerosolized desiccated pathogens being coming airborne and consequently the environment becomes more infectious so very interesting studies have come forward through the pandemic that reference humidity as an important factor to be considered to reduce the risk of infection so in looking at humidity we have to address water water is that element that holds three states. It can be an either solid, a solid, fluid, or a gas. What determines the state of water? It's temperature. In other words, the amount of thermal energy present to a sample of water. If you have water and you remove enough energy, it will become a solid when that body achieves a temperature of 32 degrees and it can no longer remain in a fluid state it becomes a solid. If you add enough energy to a sample of water, it vaporizes and becomes a vapor, a gas. Consequently, the energy required to keep water in a vapor state is the latent energy. It's the energy that you cannot feel, but it allows water to be in a vapor state. You remove enough energy water vapor will condense into a liquid and this is very important when you understand what hvac systems actually do primarily fundamentally the purpose of an hvac system is to move energy from the inside of a building to outdoors to maintain thermal comfort and proper humidity levels in the space or whenever a heat is needed in a building, energy is added to the building, such as we would see in winter months. HVAC fundamentally involves the moving of energy. Consequently, <clears throat> with humidity, there's a relationship between thermal energy and water. The higher <clears throat> the fluid temperature, the greater the evaporation rate. More water liquid becomes water vapor. The greater the molecular activity of the water, the greater the evaporation rate. Water molecules break free of a fluid state and they become a gas. So again, energy needed to sustain water in a vapor state is latent energy. So what about humidity, water vapor, the occupant, and thermal comfort? 
Well, humidity is related to human comfort because a high humidity condition reduces the evaporation rate of skin moisture or perspiration and prevents our own personal human air conditioning system from operating effectively. So thermal comfort is affected the more humid an environment. Occupiers feel warmer because their bodily cooling system is not operating effectively. So that is how humidity impacts thermal comfort. The average adult male occupant produces about 200 BTUs of latent energy. So that's quite a bit of moisture that an occupant can add to a space. A third factor that impacts thermal comfort is radiant heat. The definition of radiant heat is the emission or transmission of energy in the form of waves or particles through space or through a material medium. The best example of radiant energy, you feel it every day uh, when you walk outdoors, if it's not a cloudy day, it's that sun energy. It is the greatest source of radiant heat on Earth. And consequently, it is uh, how our Earth stays thermostatically controlled. Uh, historically, uh, the amount of radiant energy gained during the day is re-emitted back into outer space at night, creating a somewhat continuous uh, a radiant exchange of absorption and emission on Earth that maintains our natural states. Radiant energy is transferred by the electromagnetic spectrum and is measured in wavelengths. The electromagnetic spe spectrum is extraordinary. Uh, it ranges from 10 to the minus 18 meters for very high energy wavelengths in the ultraviolet range to 100 kilometers or 62 miles in low energy states. Radiant heat is a very common cause of heat thermal comfort complaints for occupants, especially those in perimeter offices. We're on a hot summer day, wall temperatures increase, and that increase of temperature is radiated in, to inside the space and will warm the occupants. Uh, adjusting the space set point temperature will have a minimal effect on the radiant effect. So um, if any of you are in the industry and you had that challenge uh, of somebody in a perimeter office and the thermostat has moved from 75 degrees to 70 degrees and the occupant is still complaining about being warm, it's very likely the radiant effect off the wall. Radiant energy moves from high energy states to lower energy states. Heat energy moves from warm surfaces to cooler surfaces. And this was the topic of the article I wrote in December on using passive radiant cooling and heating to create mechanically an imbalance of surface temperatures in the space to absorb the radiant heat effect in a space. Radiant energy travels at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, and it will not warm the air. Um, I've heard of a, a disastrous project in the East Coast when an engineering team used radiant technology along the perimeter, thinking that they can use that technology to uh, uh, impact the thermostat set point. Uh, it doesn't work very well if you're trying to warm the air. It warms surfaces. So radiant cooling is sensible heat transfer from a space that moves from either a chill panel or sail mounted in the ceilings, possibly the walls, that absorbs the heat energy of surfaces within that space, such as a human occupant with a bodily temperature, hopefully of 98 degrees. It can also be a heating source by heating a surface within a space and emitting that radiant energy to surfaces, such as occupants uh, in the space, creating a heating effect. Air movement is another factor. Uh, having proper air movement in this space will impact thermal comfort. Wherever there's a temperature or air pressure differential, you will have air movement. Air movement improves thermal comfort because it allows uh, our bodily perspiration to more efficiently evaporate and giving a cooling effect. If you have insufficient air movement in this space, you can reduce the evaporative cooling effect of an occupant 
and it may result in thermal comfort complaints. That's why ASHRAE designs air movement within the occupied zone of a building defined as six feet above a floor and one foot from the walls to be at 50 feet per minute. Uh, that is the hope is that to create enough ventilation so our, bottle, our body air conditioning system works effectively by allowing the evaporation of perspiration to occur efficiently. Metabolic rates also impact thermal comfort. A metabolic rate is the rate of transformation of chemical energy into heat energy and mechanical work by metabolic activities of an individual per a unit of skin surface area. ASHRAE references the metabolic rate in a unit of measurement called a MET, and standard 55 has a table that assigns the metabolic rate for occupants undergoing certain activities, whether it's sitting uh, quietly at a desk working, or whether it's in a gymnasium. So um, ASHRAE takes the metabolic rate into consideration uh, for uh, defining a system uh, that will provide for thermal comfort. Uh, the rate of determination, again, for what the metabolic rate can be found in standard 55 in the various charts provided. And it's also referenced in the 2009 ASHRAE Handbook Fundamentals and all the other fundamental handbooks for that matter. Another factor is clothing insulation. Clothing insulation is, is somebody walking around in an office in shorts, t-shirt and flip-flops, or are they wearing sweaters and jackets maybe in an office when they're working? The clothing insulation factor is called a CLOW, and clothing inhibits the sensible heat energy radiation of occupants, allowing us to stay warmer with the more clothes that we wear. So depending on what the, it's anticipated, what, what the occupants might be anticipated in wearing, uh, that will also impact a sense of thermal comfort in a space. ASHRAE Standard 55 has a table as well that references CLO value factors. So now that we under, uh, have an understanding of the primary factors that influence thermal comfort, uh, how do we actually move heat from a building or add heat to a building in order to maintain thermal comfort conditions. Well, first of all, let's look at the physics of equilibrium. Nature uses various properties in order to maintain equilibrium. Everything in nature, wherever there's an imbalance of energy, pressure, or whatever, always seeks equilibrium. You could call it a force of equilibrium, where there's a high energy state moving to a low energy state, hot to cold, or from high pressure to low pressure, or high humidity to low humidity. Heat transfer through natural properties occur as the universe itself is tending to a completely uniform state, otherwise known as entropy. You can't stop it. So wherever there's an imbalance of energy, you have heat transfer. So let's do a quick review. Thermal sensible heat energy is the measured value at a room thermostat, otherwise known as the dry bulb temperature. You have the latent energy, which is the energy in a building to sustain water in a vapor phase. So remembering the property that energy naturally moves from high energy states to lower energy states, it does so by four means according to the laws of physics. It can happen by conduction, it can happen by convection, radiation, or evaporation. Those are the four modes of heat tra transfer available in nature. So what are the sensible heat energy sources in the building? that will provide the energy that needs to be moved from the building to outdoors. Wherever you have occupants with a, a te body temperature of 98 degrees, they're adding heat energy to a space. Lighting, where you have the source of electrical power at lighting will cause a heat component. Computers, electrical equipment, radiated heat from perimeter walls on hot days. All of these factors increase heat energy within a building. 
What increases the amount of water vapor or latent heat in the building? Occupants through perspiration and breathing, sinks, toilets, coffee pots, anywhere where there's exposed water in a space will contribute to an increase of water vapor. So what is heat transfer to address these factors? Well, heat transfer is defined by Britannica as any or all of several types of phenomena that convey energy, move energy and entropy from one location or another. And this is what HVAC systems do. They move energy. In fact, they move energy, not necessarily by mechanical forces, though we can for high performance systems, they use mechanical energy uh, to move heat. So to cool a building, you need to have the means of moving energy within the building to outdoors. Yeah, in fact, you need to move the amount of energy gained inside the building to outdoors to maintain thermostat conditions, or you need to add enough heat energy during our winter months to maintain thermostat conditions as heat in the, inner, in the building tends to move outdoors due to nat natural properties. So what are the four modes of heat transfer? There's conduction. Wherever you have a thermal imbalance within a continuous body, you have war, a high energy state moving to a low energy state. If you're cooking at a stove and you put a pan on top of a lit burner, the heat energy from the burner is transferred to the base of the pan and travels through to the handle of the, uh, uh, of the pot. Uh, we've all experienced it. So that is conduction, heat transfer through a continuous body that has an imbalance of heat energy or thermal energy. Convection is also a mode of heat transfer. Convection is when you have fluid motion caused by less dense hot material rising and colder, more dense material falling. Convection is recognized as a mode of heat transfer. Warm air rises, cold air falls. Warm water rises, cold water falls. Radiation is another mode of heat transfer. Wherever there's an imbalance in thermal energy on surfaces, high energy states will move to cool energy states as nature is always seeking to find equilibrium. The other mode of, trans, uh, uh, of heat transfer is evaporation. And this is a little more difficult sometimes to understand. How is evaporation a mode of heat transfer? Evaporation is the process by which an element or compound transitions from its liquid state to its gaseous state below the temperature at which it boils. The process by which liquid water enters the atmosphere as water vapor. Well, to become water vapor, water has to absorb energy. And as it absorbs energy, for it to enter into a vapor state, it creates a cooling effect. It'll reduce the temperature uh, of that environment. In fact, if any of you grew up in Phoenix like I did, we had evaporative cooling back in the 60s and 70s. It wasn't that uncommon uh, and very, very good. In fact, during the drier months of the year, such as June, um, it was the evaporative effect of water evaporating into water vapor at the evaporative cooler, uh, causing a cooling effect. So water needs energy or latent energy to remain in a vapor state and a decrease in latent energy, water vapor will condense to dew point. And this is an important factor to understand. The reason why HVAC systems are fundamentally a heat or energy transfer uh, 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 methodology, we can actually control water vapor and humidity in the building by controlling the energy. If we can bring the water vapor in the building to dew point by reducing temperature to a sample of air with high humidity content, that water vapor cannot be sustained in a vapor state and will condense in condensate pans at a cooling coil. And that is how building is, uh, that is how building humidity is controlled 
by bringing the air that's being conditioned to dew point to wring the water vapor out into a liquid state where it can be evacuated from a building. What force moves moisture? Remember I said that nature has natural uh, forces um, moving energy from high energy states to low energy states. Well, it also does that with moisture. If you have a high humidity state and a low humidity state in proximity to each other, moisture from the high humid state will move to a drier condition, looking for equilibrium. The force that drives water vapor to drier conditions is called vapor pressure. Vapor pressure is the pressure of water resulting from evaporation of a liquid above a sample of the liquid or solid. It's a little more complex to understand, but it is a pressure component uh, causing a high moisture state to move to a low moisture state. So since we've defined HVAC systems fundamentally as a means for moving energy from a building to outdoors or adding energy to indoors, what conveys that energy? What do we need? Well, we need a heat transfer medium. So what is the de definition of a heat transfer medium? Well, it needs to be fluid. It needs to be something that is able to flow. Uh, so a heat transfer fluid is defined as a gas or a liquid that takes part in heat transfer by serving as an intermediary in cooling on one side of the process, such as a building, and transporting and storing thermal energy and heating on another side of the process. So again, to review, cooling is to move thermal energy from inside of a building to outdoors using a heat transfer medium and heating to add thermal energy to a building using a heat transfer medium. Dehumidification occurs by removing the latent energy from the sample of air that allows water vapor to condense into a liquid so again, dehumidification is the result of an energy transfer function. So let's look at uh, uh, air as a heat transfer fluid. First of all, quickly, what is a gas? Well, a gas fills its container taking both the shape and the volume of the container. It's fluid. It, it does not have any fixed shape in itself. And a gas is a fluid. Uh, that is to say, it has particles that easily move and change their relative position without a separation of the mass that easily yield to pressure. It's capable of flowing. Unlike solids that don't flow, fluids flow. While air is a mixture of invisible, tasteless gases that surround the Earth, and air is a heat transfer medium because it's a fluid and it has mass and it can absorb and distribute heat energy. Air is a heat transfer medium that can move heat from one location to another. We all experience in our buildings. We have an air handler on the roof or an air conditioner on the roof, and it pumps air into a building. And then through ducts, it actually brings that building air with the added energy from the sensible loads added to it back to the return grill, up through the return duct, back to the cooling coil, so air is absorbing the heat energy of that building. Water is also a fluid, and consequently, uh, the definition of water is the substance composed of chemical elements such as H2O, and it is a fluid between the temperatures of 32 and 212 degrees Fahrenheit. Water is an excellent heat transfer medium because it is, has mass and it flows, it's a fluid, Water can absorb and distribute heat energy, and water is a heat transfer medium that can move heat from one location to another. In fact, we use water in large institutions because it more efficiently moves energy than air for reasons we'll discuss here shortly. Refrigerant is also a heat transfer fluid. It is used in the refrigeration cycle of air conditioning systems where they undergo a repeated phase transition from liquid to gas. It's controlled evaporation and condensation of refrigerant that allows heat transfer to occur. Um, refrigerant is also an excellent heat transfer medium. Sorry for the typos there, it should say refrigerant. 
because refrigerant has mass and flows, it can absorb and distribute heat energy, and consequently, it is an excellent heat transfer fluid. So why am I going through these three uh, mediums of heat transfer? Well, to understand high-performance HVAC, it's important that we understand the different properties of these three heat transfer mediums. Air is not a very dense heat transfer medium, and it can only carry 0.46 BTUs per pound of air. Consequently, to condition a building, you need to push a lot of air through the building to absorb the energy of that building effectively for it to be distributed outdoors. Well, if you have a lot of air, you need big ductworks in a building. What about water as a heat transfer medium? Water is much more dense than air. Water can hold 8.98 BTUs per pound of water. Consequently, you can remove 3,300 times more energy using water as a heat transfer medium than air, meaning that it requires less pumping horsepower to move the same amount of energy from a building than opposed to fan horsepower air, an all air system would require. This is where your energy efficiency comes in for chill beam systems and passive radiant cooling and heating because we actually use water as the sensible heat transfer medium local to each zone, not air. Well, let's look at refrigerant. Refrigerant is even more dense than water and can harbor 88.2 BTUs of refrigerant. And the refrigerant is a good example of why VRV systems or variable refrigerant systems are efficient, effective heat transfer mediums because they can move so much energy with so little uh, refrigerant. And consequently, these systems, if you bring that refrigerant local to each zone, the condition each zone, are much more efficient in moving building energy from inside a building to outdoors and as well as for adding heat energy in heating mode. So air is a heat transfer medium. Let's look at air, our conventional mode of heat, a medium for heat transfer. Um, air is supplied as a heat transfer medium through a web of metal ductworks in a building to distribute cool conditioned air to each zone where that air absorbs the sensible heat energy that becomes present to that space and it's returned back to an air handler's cooling coil where that energy is removed and deposited to outdoors. Supply air should be injected into a space at about 55 degrees, which by the way is dew point for water vapor to condense into water liquid. And that's how we control our humidity levels by bringing water vapor generated within a building or introduced into a building from outdoors uh, and, and by uh, we control the amount of humidity by bringing that water vapor to dew point at the cool at the chill water coil or at the cooling coil to 55 degrees to wring that water vapor out. Air that that absorbs energy in the space will achieve 75 to 80 degrees within the space uh, and is removed consequently through return and exhaust grills in the space. The total energy load of a building is the sum of the sensible heat and the latent heat. So the total load is a combination of the sensible and latent heat, and that total load in conventional HVAC systems is seen at an air handler cooling coil. So let's look at water as a heat transfer medium. Water is very efficient in moving energy because it is so much more dense. And water is used to, uh, uh, to be distributed through co uh, conventional all air systems to the cooling coil of an air handler. Uh, if we bring chill water to an air handler about 44 degrees, the objective and the goal is to bring the sample of building air to 55 degrees or dew point to not only remove the thermal energy of that sample of air from a building, but also to remove the latent energy or the water vapor from um, the sample of air. Uh, also, we can use hot water coils in air handlers as well to add heat energy when we're in heating mode. Water, again, is more dense than air and retains more energy and is more efficient than all air systems. 
Chiller central plants are common for, well, are, are required for chill water systems. There are air-cooled chiller solutions and there are water-cooled chiller solutions. And uh, both vary depending on how we actually evacuate the building energy into the ambient condition. An air-cooled chiller will actually evacuate that energy into the ambient air through the condensing section of an air-cooled chiller or in a water-cooled central plant, a chiller will evacuate that building energy to a cooling tower loop that uses evaporation in the cooling towers to finally eject the energy absorbed from a building. <clears throat> so what about refrigerant as a heat transfer medium? Well, it's excellent because it's so dense. And this is why variable refrigerant systems are getting momentum because they actually supply the refrigerant local to each building zone. So you're not pumping all the air throughout the building to do so. And so air uh, refrigerant is a very excellent, efficient method of heat transfer uh, that should be considered for high efficiency buildings. So what are the ASHRAE standards that uh, actually uh, define the various uh, conditions that a building needs to attain to maintain thermal comfort, better IAQ. Uh, well, the ASHRAE standards are involved are standard 52.2. ASHRAE 52.2 def defines the testing methodology of filters. They assign MERV rating for filters. It's conventional in HVAC to use a MERV 8 filter. However, the pandemic introduced the realization that you can actually remove more contaminant and pathogens from the space by using more efficient filtration. They recommend a minimum of MERV 13, ideally MERV 14. If you hear these terms, they're all in reference to the standard 52.2 that defines the test testing methodology of filter medium uh, and their effectiveness and efficiency in removing contaminant and particulate from the air. ASHRAE standard 55, uh, the purpose of the standard we've already discussed. They actually define building set point conditions to maintain thermal comfort and to provide uh, that uh, is comprised of the six factors that we've discussed earlier today. All of that can be found in standard 55. And it's rather surprising that um, really how complex the thermal comfort factor is in a building. By the way, standard 55 is adopted for all buildings except for healthcare facilities, where standard 170 is, uh, takes precedence for hospitals and uh, 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 medical uh, uh, buildings uh, uh, with regard to their set points that need to create a better standard of IAQ conducive to uh, healing. ASHRAE standard 62.1 addresses the amount of outdoor air that we need to bring into buildings. It actually defines the minimum ventilation rates. ASHRAE's epidemic task force stated that in order to reduce the, in order to reduce the risk of infection, buildings need to make sure that they are receiving the minimum outside air prescribed by 62.1 to create a healthier environment. This task force also recommends increasing your outside air to even further reduce the risk of infection. And then for hospitals, uh, hospital standard or ASHRAE standard 170 really defines the standards for hospitals, uh, the conditions of operating rooms, patient rooms, whether or not there are patient rooms that are uh, uh, AIA uh, or AII, airborne infectious uh, isolation rooms or protective environments for patients who have compromised immune systems. So uh, standard 170 defines the conditions of healthcare facilities. So with that, that brings us to a close of today's presentation. The next session that we will give is on humidity, and that is quite an involved discussion. Uh, what is humidity and how do we control humidity in the space? What are the properties of water vapor? And uh, uh, we will evaluate that more closely in the physics of, uh, of, of moisture, tr uh, moisture transfer from high, vapor, high water vapor states to low vapor states. So are there any questions? 
So right now there are no questions in the chat. So if anybody does have any questions, you can put them in the chat or you feel free to take yourself off. And we do have a few minutes that we can cover some questions. Uh, will this presentation be available for review at a later time? Yes, it will be. Um, I will send out an email once it's ready. It'll be uploaded to our website along with um, the PowerPoint to be able to download. Thanks, Mark, for joining us. Thank you, Mark. I have to give it a few minutes. Okay. All right. Well, Kelly, if people think of questions um, later in the day or later in the week or whatever, by all means, just have them um, email us and uh, we'll make sure that their questions are addressed. Absolutely. Um, so I do have a couple that came through. Uh, will there be future presentations on this series? Yes, we have humidification. We have fan system effects. Um, we have psychrometrics. Psychrometrics. Yep, yep. So um, definitely make sure that you're signed up for our newsletter. Oh, Dan, can you um, take it back to the opening slide? Um, I always wanted to cover the LinkedIn thing one more time. Yeah, just and a second here. Let me find while it. you are doing that, is there a, an ASHRAE standard for labs? I believe it's 170, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, ASH for laboratories? Mm -hmm. The Yes. What is the standard for labs? It escapes me. I think it's 170. No, that's for healthcare. Is that healthcare? Yeah. No, no, there is a, there is a standard. Um, but what I think what also uh, to look at is the ANSI standard Z9.5. The ASHRAE standard for labs, the number escapes me, quite frankly. Okay. It shouldn't, but I it's, should. It clearly escapes me, too. I had 170 in my brain. Okay. Kelly, I'm almost there. I apologize. There's an easier <laughs> way to do this. There is definitely an easier way. There we go. You can stop right there. All right, so once again, for the few that are still left on, if you missed the beginning of our presentation, we are giving away an Amazon gift card um, for anybody who, um, who likes our LinkedIn page or follows it between now and April 1st. So you can scan that QR code or you can just jump on um, your computer and go to Veritech Solutions on our LinkedIn and follow us. Um, on April 1st, I will announce the winners um, through an email. Um, Labs ASHRAE is 90.1. Well, 90.1 is that does that cover labs in it? In 90.1? Uh, so I think there's a specific one specific there, to labs. There is. Standard 90.1 is efficiency. Yeah. Amanda, if you already follow us on LinkedIn, thank you. <laughs> Maybe we'll do something different next time. <laughs> Uh, for the question on standard ASHRAE standard in laboratories, please email Kelly and we will get that back to you. Yeah, um, I'm literally drawing a mental blank because <laughs> I work with critical environments and room pressure control regularly and why that has escaped my memory, I don't know. <laughs> uh, okay. So, um, Nilda. I don't know if I mispronounced your name. If you want to go ahead and email me, we can follow up with you. And... All right. There are no more questions coming in. So if nobody else has anything. All right. Well, thank you for joining us today. We appreciate your interest and are always welcome for questions that you might have in the future. And we hope to see you next month. Awesome. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.